evening. I'm Jose Cardenas. Tonight on Horizonte, we'll talk about the campaign to overhaul Arizona's primary election system, plus a program allowing parents who are legally in the U.S. to apply for refugee status for their children who are living in three countries in Central America. And in Sounds of Cultura, SOC, learn about the performance collective La Pocha Nostra. All this coming up next on Horizonte. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Recent polling data by the group Open Primaries shows that Arizona voters support election reforms with 72% polled feeling there are flaws in Arizona's current closed primary system. In support of this movement in Arizona, Open Primaries has launched a campaign to help independent voters further reform Arizona's electoral process. Joining me now to talk about this is Armida Lopez, Arizona Latino Outreach Coordinator for the group Open Primaries. Armida, thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you for having me. Tell us exactly what it is Open Primaries is looking to do. Uh, we are part of a national organization that seeks to support local efforts around uh, the different states in the country that are wanting to open the primary election process so that every registered voter, regardless of their party affiliation, can participate in primary elections. And it's not just that, that uh, uh, independents can vote in the Democratic and Republican primary. You're also looking to change how the, the candidates are selected for the general. Uh, yes, so in a uh, primary election process, every candidate, regardless of their party, is on the same ballot, and you as the, indi uh, you as the voter have the opportunity to choose the best candidate for the job. So it levels the playing field for both the candidates as well as the voters to have a, a participation in primary elections. Now, you're not talking about letting independents vote in the Republican primary and then letting them vote if they haven't already voted, I assume. In the Democrat, you're just you're talking about rather massive change. Yes, uh, this would be a, a, a definite change to our current uh, system uh, because you have now both uh, Democrats and Republicans, as well as any other uh, candidate that wants to run, whether it be independent, have a, 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 an ability to face every voter in their district as opposed to, say, just the, their base or just their own party. So there'd be one primary. One primary election, and, and this is, uh, and then the two top vote getters would, would run in general. Correct. So it would be a top two system where the candidates with the most, two, the top two candidates with the most votes go on to the general election. Therefore, you might have two Republicans, two Democrats, maybe a Democrat and an Independent. Um, it's about the candidates getting the most votes that get to go on. And and uh, without changing the the boundaries of the district, you're not proposing that, right? No. Not so at all. how does this make any difference? If you have a district that's already heavily Republican, what difference does it make if you open it up to independents? Good question. So currently in the state of Arizona, uh, the largest registered party are, is independents. So uh, about 38 percent of registered voters are independent. They're pretty much excluded from being able to participate in the primary election process because each party has a closed primary where they elect their own candidates. Um, we're proposing that in an open primary system, uh, you have candidates that are willing to listen to every uh, person in their constituency, uh, therefore uh, having a more well-rounded candidate that will uh, hopefully move on to the general elections and therefore uh, once they're in the legislature, we'll see uh, better legislation, better coalition building, uh, we work across the aisle to, to benefit uh, the public at large. Now, is it really going to make any difference because uh, independents have a reputation for not voting? Uh, well, that, that has been the case that uh, many people would say that. However, we do feel that when uh, independents aren't able to participate um, in a more fair way in the sense that you have, uh, a, as an independent, I, I have to uh, register under a party to be able to exercise my right to vote. Uh, we're saying you as an American have the right to, to, to vote regardless of your party affiliation. Uh, by opening up the primary, uh, primary election process, you get to do that. Everybody gets to vote. And what I just said about independence is even more true of the Latino voters. Um, the criticism is that Latinos don't vote. Uh, yes, uh, we are doing better. Uh, we are now, you know, coming out uh, 
slowly but surely we're turning out. However, why this is important is because Latinos now uh, in record numbers are registering as independent and therefore too are being excluded from the primary election process. So what are you doing? You're, you're in charge of Latino outreach. What does that mean? Um, I seek to get in front of as many Latinos uh, before Election Day in November of 2016 to educate them about the open primary system, why it's important that we uh, participate in primary elections, as well as why we are uh, being excluded from the process unless we do something to reform the uh, primary election system. Uh, we will see, you know, uh, Latinos being uh, alienated from, from exercising our right to vote. And reform, it will take the, the form of a ballot initiative, is that right, in the 2016 election? That's correct. It will be a statewide ballot initiative that we will get to vote on in November of 2016. We uh, are doing it by process of referendum, so in uh, early part of next year we'll start collecting signatures, um, get uh, a proposition number probably by the summer and uh, vote on it in the general election. Between now and the end of the year, are there any special activities you're involved in to try and get awareness of the campaign? Yes, we're having our first uh, Latino cultural event this Friday at the Arizona Latino Arts and Cultural Center where we seek to uh, bring out as many people to come out and uh, have a good time. We're having some mariachis and ballet folklorico, but we're also going to release uh, part of our polling that we did uh, for the Latino community uh, in regards to open primaries. So there'll be some learning and education involved as well as uh, a good time. So one last question, uh, if people want more information about open primaries and, and things they can do to get involved, how do they get it? Uh, very easy. Uh, uh, get on our website, www.openprimaries.org, uh, encouraging more people to join our movement, get educated. Uh, the more people know, the more people are uh, supporting our effort. And, and is there a number that they can call or? They can. We have a local number. They can reach us at 623-428-1228, uh, where uh, we're happy to get people, uh, if they want to volunteer, they want to uh, get more involved, uh, learn more. Uh, we are uh, expanding our, our movement uh, every day. Armida Lopez, thanks for joining us on Horizonte to talk about this project. Thank you. I appreciate it. In December 2014, the U.S. State Department announced the launch of an in-country refugee parole program in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. The Central American Minors CAM program allows certain parents who are legally present in the U.S. to apply for refugee status for their children currently living in Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. Joining me to talk about this is Christopher Debreseni, Community Integration Manager for the International Rescue Committee in Phoenix. Chris, welcome to Horizonte. Thank you for having me. Um, a lot of publicity about a year ago about all the kids coming from uh, these three countries and others. Um, uh, this is an outgrowth of that. This is. This is a response from the mass influx of kids coming from Central America to our southern border in 2014. And this is a way for, for children in that same situation to actually come to the United States and, and join their parents. Correct. This is a response from uh, assisting those youth so that they're not traveling and being subject to gangs and other violence and they have a safe but legal way to enter the United States. But this is not what we're doing with the kids who are already here? No. It's, it's an entirely different program? Correct. These are the youth that are still living within Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador and then they're reuniting with parents here in the United States. 
the program, though, hasn't actually kicked off, or at least you don't have any people who have gone through it, right? Based on last, uh, last notes, that there were 450 applications, and about 100 are ready to uh, leave. The, the families are still pending. So how does it work? So a, a eligible parent who lives in the United States has one of several uh, statuses. One of them is a lawful permanent resident, a parolee, someone who's under uh, temporary protected status from either El Salvador or Honduras, and they can petition for their child in, the, in their, the Central America. That child has to be under 21, unmarried, and still living in nationality within those three countries. You mentioned there are several hundred applicants. How long does the process take? I mean, when will we actually see somebody come through this program? That's unsure. One of the things that the government has really been about is that this is a meticulous process so that there are no mistakes. There's a, lot, there's a big spotlight on immigration, especially from these youth. So we want to make sure that the immigration is done properly and they have a path to citizenship. And by mistake, what would be a mistake? Uh, letting somebody in who what, might be a gang member or something like no, that? No, more letting someone in who is not a biological or dependent of a U.S., uh, someone who, an adult who's eligible at that time. You talked about a spotlight. Have the events in Paris of the last weekend um, intensified that spotlight? Anytime there's a world event like that, it spotlights not only refugees, but obviously everyone as a whole. So th this particular situation has spotlighted on the refugee world. And I understand somebody has announced some plans uh, to, to focus on this program. That is unfortunate, but yes, that's true. And, and tell us about that. Um, as a refugee resettlement agency in Phoenix, we, we have been notified that a certain individual wants to come to our office and um, I guess talk to us, for lack of a better phrase. This is the same gentleman who was uh, demonstrating outside mosques a few months ago? That would be correct. Um, well, your, your program is, is focused on this. Uh, just last question. Um, how many people do you think will actually come through and uh, end up in Arizona? To be honest with you, I, I, I can't estimate a guess. But we are one of the, the areas where, where people will be relocated? Correct. As a resettlement agency, we are the only ones who are allowed to do the CAM AOR. So we will be helping those families that are, those eligible adults that are here petition for their children within those three countries. Well, thank you so much for joining us on Horizonte to talk about this program. Thank you. Appreciate it. To find out more information about what's on Horizonte, go to azpbs.org and click on the Horizonte tab at the top of the screen. There you can access many features to become a more informed Horizonte viewer. Watch interviews by clicking on the video button or by scrolling down to the bottom of the page for the most recent segments. Learn about more specific topics like arts and culture and immigration. You can also find out what's on Horizonte for the upcoming week. If you would like an RSS feed, a podcast, or you want to buy a video, that's all on our website too. Other features include our collection of website links and a special page for educators. While you're there, show your support for Horizonte with just one click. Discover all that's on Horizonte. Visit azpbs.org, Horizonte, today. Watch sneak previews of what's coming soon to 8. Go to azpbs.org slash previews today. In tonight's Sounds of Cultura, SOC, La Pocha Nostra, this performance collective looks to explore how social categories reinforce unequal social and political relationships by using the border as a physical, conceptual, and spiritual terrain that must be challenged. With me to talk about La Pocha Nostra is ASU School of Film, Dance, and Theater Associate Professor Micah Espinosa and Michelle Ceballos Bichot. La Pocha Nostra core troop member. Thank you both for joining us on Horizonte. Um, Michelle, it, it, uh, we mentioned a moment ago you're a core troop member. What does that mean? And give us a little bit of the history of La Pocha Nostra. Well, the, a core troop member, uh, we work in a horizontal mo a model, 
And so there's about a, a core of five that we do everything. So we're in charge of um, finding the projects, um, negotiating the projects, the whole thing. And this all started, what, back in the mid-90s or yeah, so? Yeah, it, it started about 20 years ago. And um, it started with a man called Guillermo Gomez Peña, who he himself is a performance artist, an activist, a writer, a poet. He's written about 12 books. They actually study his work in performance studies and Latino studies as well. And he was touring. And the way that I connected with him was when he brought a project here called the Temple of Confessions to the Scottsdale Center for the Arts. And um, a, a very great artist here named Zarco Guerrero recommended me to him. He was looking for a collaborator and another collaborator that was Norma Medina from Borderlands Theater in Tucson. And so we met, connected, loved the project, and got involved. So tell us about what are the common themes because it's evolved over the years and, and one show is different from, from one performance to the next. Yeah, the basic structure is the same. It's, there's not a proscenium. It's not like traditional theater or dance where you come in and sit down. Usually the audience actually wanders and the, there's small stages. That, so that kind of structure is, is different than the traditional. And the shows themselves, um, they're thematic. So we've done Mexotica or the Museum of Fetishized Identities. Basically, the, the, um, the Monstros en la Frontera that we just did, the, the basic idea is about crossing all sorts of borders and about identity, borders and identity. It did start about Mexico and the United States because that was Guillermo's story, his quest. And then it's morphed now from the different artists that are involved to have to do with all sorts of borders, gender, race, I, um, identity, place, color. No? And Micah, your work also is, is very reflective of those same kinds of themes. Tell us a little bit about that and then your involvement with La Pocha Nostra. Yeah, I'm professor of voice and acting in the School of Film, Dance, and Theater. And the work that I do is I'm a master teacher that fits Moore's voice work. In this work, I, I help people embody their voice. I help them find vibration. And um, so it's not only singing and speaking, but one's right to speak. So when I studied La Pocha Nostra and then started working with them, there was a clear connection between freeing oneself and um, pure expression. So to speak, not to impress, but to express. So uh, there was a clear connection between the radical performance pedagogy of La Pocha Nostra and my Fitzmaurice voice work. And let's talk about the performance that was what, just last week? On Saturday night. Oh. Give us a sense for that one. Well, it was at Club Palazzo, which is um, right across from, um, it's on Central and Roosevelt, mm -hmm. um, right around that area. And we had about 200 people there. And the show, Imagine Pocha Aesthetics with um, Pocha Style and Crazy Techno Toys, the professors and students of the Arts, Media, and Engineering program at Arizona State University created some amazing toys for us to play with. So we used voice as a side of identity, and we manipulated the voice in all sorts of wonderful ways. We've got some pictures we're going to show of, of that performance, but before right. we do that, I've got pictures of the two of you in, mm -hmm. in other performances. In the first one, uh, Micah, um, we're going to put up on the screen right now. This is, this is one that you were involved in. Tell us about it. Mm -hmm. That was in Ciudad de Carmen um, in Mexico, and I went down there to work with Guillermo on a show, and that particular song was called The Song of Violence. And um, that doesn't seem like a border town, Ciudad de Carmen, but it is a border town. It's in Yucatan. In the Yucatan. Southern Mexico. Um, the oil rigs um, have created a whole other city. So while we were there, the, the men would come off these oil rigs and now an entire industry was created with table dancing and all, all sorts of things and the the artists were thrilled that we were there creating this work because a lot of the theater departments had been decimated uh, because all the money is going towards building and oil and technology and the arts have been left so when we arrived everybody was really happy and it was a, an amazing show. Now, uh, Michelle, uh, the picture we have of you that we're going to put on mm -hmm. the screen, uh, most people wouldn't expect to see a dancer, uh, and you look like you're in, in ballet mm -hmm. shoes and, and tutu on a motorcycle. Yes, well, that's one of my personas, which is a, kind of like a psychotic ballerina. That was one of my first personas based on my own life. I was a professional ballerina. I danced in Russia and Europe and 
all over. So this this is our studio, um, the Pocha Nosa studio in Mexico City, and we did a photo shoot based on using some of our personas. And what we do is we mix that personas. It's very baroqueish, all sorts of. So yes, you wouldn't see a ballerina on a motorcycle, but there are many ballerinas that that ride motorcycles. We haven't had very many on our show, um, <laughs> uh, but we have had ballerinas. We've, we've got uh, now some pictures. We got three pictures uh -huh. uh, from from this last performance. Uh, the first one is um, a DJ character. Tell yeah. me about this one. That's Logan Phillips. He is um, a, a poet, amazing poet, performer. He's called um, Sonoran Strange is the name of his book, and he's out of Tucson. And he um, recently did a show here with Performance in the Borderlands, and he is an associate like myself with La Pocha Nostra. And what was, what was he doing in this show this last week? Well, we had um, an improvisation between sometimes Guillermo's poetry, my poetry, his music, and then the artists of arts, media, and engineering, and their sound toys. And so sometimes the voice would go very high, sometimes the voice would go very fast, and then sometimes there'd be music underneath it. So it was a live improvisation during the performance between sometimes all three of us. And we've got two more pictures, some very mm -hmm. interesting characters. I think they've been in, in the shows before. Um, this one, tell us about this one, Michelle. This one, uh, um, is that, that's with Balitronica and Guillermo, okay, Balitronica and Guillermo Gomez Peña. And this is 10 ways how to, to, of how to kill a Mexican. And then 10 ways how to ki kill a woman. And then the audience participation. And you'd be surprised how many people pick up that weapon and very confidently uh, will point it at a body. So it's really creating that putting you in a position of that choice. And I want to oh. talk more about audience participation, mm -hmm. but we have one more picture I want to make sure we get to. Uh, a mariachi, but not, not the kind of mariachi you would normally see. A phantom mariachi. And this symbol actually um, is appearing a lot in San Francisco at, at all. The, you know what's happening with San Francisco, like every, every other city. It's going through this gentrification where the Mission District now from all the, 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 the families that have been there for centuries with their tortilleras and stuff are now these very chic um, torta, tortilla, no? The people are being pushed out. So there's a lot of... Because of the tech workers, yes, Google, yes. And Apple. Yes, I mean, and, and, and evicted. I mean, it's just awful what's going on. And so the Fantin Mariachi appears at all the events as, as this symbol the symbol of, of the repression, really, the, of the identity of the, of, of the individual in this context of por, porque la mayoría de la gente son mexicana que viven ahí, son la gente original de ese lugar. So, no? so, so we, we don't have translation, but, but the, you said the majority of the people there are Mexicans uh -huh. and, and they were the original uh -huh. inhabitants. Um, uh, Micah, uh, we talked about, uh, mentioned audience participation. There was audience participation in this last performance, some of it related to what happened in Paris. Yeah, the entire show, and we, as a troupe, uh, we talked about this. We were all very moved that evening, and then we had a, a show the next day. So we couldn't ignore that. Um, we had already planned uh, a battle between nationals and internationalists and um, all p the way we separate ourselves so all types of identities and we had uh, bats and people were <laughs> hitting each other with these playful bats it was a really fun moment with fun music and dancing and people hitting each other with bats but then Guillermo Gomez Peña uh, did one of his pieces a very poignant piece uh, Je suis Charlie. Yeah, Je ne suis Charlie. Je ne suis Charlie. Yeah. And uh, mm. the Referring audience... Referring to the shootings of a... Yeah. What, at the beginning of the year? Charlie Hebdo. Yeah. And then um, the audience impulsively began to take the bats and put them down. And it was a very symbolic moment and a very strong, cathartic moment for everyone there at the show. And not just the, the victims of what happened in France, but he names all of them. Uh, here, all the, the, the shootings that are, have been going on here, and no, so it's really it goes everything through. against the violence mm -hmm. in our world. Mm -hmm. And so 
the symbols, each one of the, the characters, each one of these personas that are created in the actions said something about uh, against the violence in our world, um, 500 years of machismo, that was another piece. Um, we had the Borda Buta, there were all sorts of different actions. My Border prostitute. Exactly. Yeah. Border Buta. Um, my uh, persona, the tamer of the wild tongue. Well, it's all very fascinating, very mm -hmm. powerful, <laughs> evocative performances. Thank you for joining us on oh, Horizonte to talk you. about it. It's been a pleasure. And that is our show for tonight from all of us here at Horizonte and your Arizona PBS station. Thank you for watching. I'm Jose Cardenas. Have a good evening. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station.